going to introduce myself just a second here, but I'd like to start with one claim, one assertion, and one question, because that's really the theme that we're going to go through today and kind of pick up on these two things as we discuss this concept. And so the claim is, the assertion is, is that um, in this new world of AI and IoT and empathic computing, that augmented reality or mixed reality, diminished reality, any of those things that we're calling it these days, will be the medium of choice, will be the preferred way to communicate and convey information in that, con in that era, in that concept. So we're moving into a new mass medium, as it were. That's the claim. So the question is, like Mr. Baird in the Double Rainbow video, right? What does it all mean? <laughs> Right? What does this mean uh, if we're going to be communicating and connecting digital contents to everything physical and emotional around us as educators, as communicators, as people just trying to learn in this new age of um, highly curated, highly individualized information? All right, so my name is Eric Hawkinson. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, I got a couple of titles here up in the, there on the screen there, but probably most relevant today is um, I'm a research coordinator of a group called Maver Mixed Augmented Virtual Realities and Learning. We're based in Japan. I personally am based in Kyoto, Japan. Uh, we're doing a bunch of different research projects based around augmented and virtual realities and learning uh, contexts, mostly in language acquisition and higher education. And I uh, started a couple of projects, one of which we can see uh, at the expo, and I'll tell you a little bit more if we have time. Right, so I'm Eric. So to help with my claim, right, the first thing that I was talking about, right, the, we're moving into this new mass meeting, right? This is still argumented on, still debated on, but I think as we move forward, it's pretty much going to be the case, right? So if you think about mass meetings moving forward, we had our, we have, especially for learning context, we had our books, and then we moved on to cinema and radio, TV, right, right? They all changed the way that we learn, the way we communicate, right? In the book era, we cherished the wordsmith, cherished the word, we thought about their arrangement in certain ways, and that changed, of course, when we got to hear people's voices, right? And TV, a week in a smile, meant something extra to that. And it changed again, of course, with the internet, now that it's on demand, it's very important for learning for us, right? We're starting to get just-in-time information. And in the mobile era, that's even more prevalent, right? We're Googling things on the spot, we're learning things as we do them, and this is going to be exacerbated in many ways with augmented reality, because now, in the mobile era, uh, we have all of these things in our pockets. We have the book, the TV, the radio, available to us at all times, we just have to pull them out of our pockets, but in this augmented era, that information is coming out of our pockets, and it's gonna be connected to a wall, an emotion, um, a person standing next to you. And it's not only that, it's going to be curated in a way that connects those things as being presented to you, sometimes without you even thinking about it or asking about it. So instead of saying, hey, Google now, you're going to be given curated content that something, some algorithm, something thinks that you might want to be. It's trying to predict. We're moving beyond asking questions right in time we need it and being shown things that we that some algorithm thinks that we need already. And so that's going to dramatically change the way we learn and we teach moving forward. So that's to help my claim to kind of explain that a little bit better. So to kind of explain this, I, th I feel like sometimes it's best to give analogies, right? Um, augmented reality, if you haven't experienced it or haven't experienced it in different ways, it's really hard to explain. So the first analogy I usually give is the bridge, right? It's, it works on several different levels, right? It's a bridge between the physical world and the digital world. It's a link between time and space. It can be all these great things, a bridge between two, th two brains, two ideas, and things like that. It connects physical things to digital things or digital things to other things. It's connecting all these things together. But as a medium, it also has this bridge analogy connected to it as well because the way that information is presented to you makes a big difference. Uh, Marshall McLuhan was a big person in the 60s that talked about the TV and how it's going to transform how we learn and think. And the massness of that communication, how it's broadcasted, it had its own meaning in itself. Right? We had a common base 
of reality with the evening news. Uh, millions of people are watching the same information every evening, and that in itself changed the message from which it was broadcast. So the bridge for which this information is being presented to you now, it's more individualized, it's being curated for specific people. That common base might start to be diminished in different ways. But also, especially for first-time users or people that use it quite often, the, the complexity and the, the novelty of it can be something too. So pretend that island in, in the distance is what you're, the information you're trying to convey. So if you have this big, beautiful bridge going over it, you might stop and think where you're going for a second and think about the bridge that you're on. So instead of in the learning context, that means if you're presenting something that's overlaying digital information on the real world, you might stop and think, why am I seeing this? Uh, how is this being presented to me? It almost seems like magic in some ways. So you're thinking about the process of the information being delivered to you rather than trying to consume the, the content that that person wants to pervade you through that medium. So here's an example from my lab. A lot of years ago, this is a computer vision algorithm uh, based on image recognition. We're showing this off at the booth as well. The car image is being recognized and then any digital contents is being displayed over it. In this case, it's a video uh, volunteering at TEDx Kyoto, where we are now. So uh, that's just a hint, right? That's just a playing card. So now the digital content, anything from the internet is now being connected to like a piece of paper, right? It's just one very rudimentary example of this technology. And it's already much more advanced than this. Okay, analogy number two. Um, the automation of the learning process is very key when thinking about augmented reality, in this, especially in learning contexts. Uh, I'm almost hesitant to tell the story, but I will anyway. But So in elementary school, I got caught cheating a couple of times, right? You have these reading assessments, <laughs> reading assessments, and the answers are in the back of the book, right? So, of course, a couple of times I opened the book, read maybe the first paragraph, and went right to the back of the book and read the answers, right? And, of course, that was cheating. It robbed me of the process of reading that whole paragraph and getting the practice. Maybe, maybe it was a root thing, but um, that, that idea, that concept is being exacerbated by these technologies. And one good example of this is botany, right? Let's say that you're learning to be a botanist. You're walking, taking a hike somewhere. You notice a nice flower, and you have to kind of start processing a bunch of information to kind of come down on that species. What is this flower? What season is it? Where am I in the world? Um, how's the weather been recently? Um, how many petals are on this particular? Where is it growing? Are there a lot together? But with augmented reality, it's, you can just either take a snapshot of it or the, whatever algorithm you're using will take a picture of that and go out on the web and analyze it and compare it to thousands of other pictures of flowers. The phone, if you're using the phone, knows where you are, GPS location. So all that information gets mashed together and then curated and you get, get shown the species of flower to a pretty accurate degree. So that whole process of discovery, of the, of the learning self-questioning process, is almost robbed of It's almost like what I did going to the back of the book with the answers. Now, this doesn't happen all the time. This is going to be highly dependent on how we design the learning process through this medium as well. But in short, that's what's going to be happening a lot more with this just-in-time information. The, the, the self-curation, the discovery process might be diminished in many ways um, when we use this for learning purposes. So what does this mean for our brains? Our brains are starting to get you know, sometimes we get much too much information, right? Already with this mobile era, we're getting notifications every other minute. Um, we're being overloaded with a lot of information. And a lot of, the, a lot of the ways, this is also going to be exacerbated in this new era of getting this information given to us without being asked. So we can take a lot of research, a lot of hints that are, we've learned from the mobile era. We're still learning a lot with just that era itself already moving into this augmented era, but things like uh, compulsion loops, right? We want a piece of information, social media, and business models, unfortunately, build us a lot into the way we, they parse information out in little bits, so we have to keep coming back to them. We 
get a little dopamine rush, put the phone back, and then that keeps going in this compulsion loop. And we get starting to get this, everyone heard, heard of nomophobia? Nomophobia? No mobile phobia, that's right? Your fear, so I censor, I, I work at a university and I take a census of students and increasingly the biggest cause of stress is low battery, no Wi-Fi, right? You're not, you're being disconnected. So this fear, right, of not being connected to your digital self, your digital person is also going to be exacerbated because if you're getting information, right now, let's, for example, memory is also being affected, right? So nobody remembers phone numbers anymore because we got them in their pockets. So very soon we're going to get facial recognition into these algorithms, so we're gonna get look at someone and maybe their name will appear above their face. Does this mean we don't remember names as much? Um, where we're going, self-navigation, things like that. So the, the long-term, short-term uh, movement of information in our brains might be affected in very profound ways. We're still not very sure about that. The business models affect that very much. So schools in general, what does that look like in this new era? Um, there's a couple of different possibilities, but um, we're starting to learn, already in the mobile era, we start to understand the value of learning things as we do them, right? So get the the uni traditional university lecture is starting to be less and less useful. You can just watch that on demand, right, on a YouTube video. Um, recently there was a, uh, a boycott at a university in India because too many of their professors were lecturing and they want, they demanded they could get put online so they didn't have to travel to campus as much. So this is just part of that that's happening in the future. And companies are, as our universities are asking us, they want more the ability to train at the job site as they go. And this is gonna happen more and more with the augmented reality. Whatever you're looking at, wherever you are, this information is gonna get curated to you. You're going to get contextual learning for what you're doing, who you're doing it with, and where you are. So what that means for classrooms is a lot of different things. You need a reason to bring people together, you need a reason to curate. It's a little more coaching, a little more facilitation, of course. We already know this in the mobile era, but this is gonna get worse in the augmented era. Okay, big topic here. Um, there's a lot of, as a researcher, I've bumped into this quite often already, legal and ethical issues around using this especially in schools. There's a bunch of different ideas and concepts around this that can be potentially dangerous and, quite frankly, a little bit frightening for teachers. So the first is about data collection, right? Your mobile phone is already your leash, right? It, you, it knows where you're going, what you're looking at, if you take out your phone, it knows how you're moving your hands, right, with the uh, accelerometer inside your phone. This is only gonna get exacerbated Augmented reality. If your eye movements are going to be tracked. Your voice is going to be analyzed. Your location movements and your interactions with other people. And this together can be a very frightening picture if somehow this were collected and used against you in unsavory ways. And it could be potentially dangerous to students as well. Legal issues around this too. There are still a lot of question marks as far as if. I tie some digital contents to a physical place. Um, can that be copyrighted? What's, what's the legal standpoint of me putting my digital contents overlaid on somebody else's face, perhaps, or on somebody's mom, perhaps? Right? There's all these big questions, legal questions, about putting digital contents, connecting digital contents to things of your physical nature or your personality. We have these things that deep fakes are coming up, right? Augmented reality where people are able to look and feel and sound like announcers on TV, popular people, presidents, and they're changing, putting words into their mouths using this technology. Is that going to be legal moving forward or not? Okay, so that's a little bit, some analogies, some, some things. So I'd like to share a little bit about some of the things that our research group is doing with this technology. <coughs> Uh, it's a group called Maver, Mixed Augmented Virtual Realities and Learning, in Japan. And we found that one of the big powerful things about this technology is just getting people up and moving them around, because right? their learning goes with them and it's contextual to who you're with. So we have this community rally in um, Fukuchiyama, it's a northern part of Kyoto Prefecture, I like to call it upstate Kyoto. And we, we group people 
students with people in the community and gave them an app and told them to go out and look for triggers out in the community. And when they, for example, this is the lobby of the local library, they got triggered and this video is giving them instructions to go up to a specific room in that library and take a very specific route. Because up the stairs, instead of taking the elevator in this particular library, on the wall is a history of the city of Kuchiyama, where this is based. So you get to see some of the historical background. And what I can do with this technology is actually, the wall is written in Japanese, and so the computer vision algorithm knows the date on that wall, and it overlays the English information on top of that. So there's a little bit of language learning going on with this as well. So they're gonna walk up, so maybe you can see that in just a second here. So here's the first wall here. <laughs> Another marker that'll get loaded. And so what was a Japanese written on the wall now has the English written on top of it. So they'll follow this kind of course, getting up to one room up on the top floor, and then there's a lockbox there with a cipher that's also an augmented reality. And they have to remember or recall or go back and find that information on the stairs to open that box. And then they get another sheet which will give them a hint to go somewhere else in the city. So they're running around the city doing these challenges, these hints, these clues. And this gives them a more uh, immersive feel to it because now we're getting a narrative, some videos, some more immersive video, uh, media that go along with this kind of scavenger hunt activity. Uh, one more project, it's called the Before I Graduate Project, that we also did in Fukuchiyama. Uh, just put a piece, big old piece of paper up on the wall and ask students to share some hope, some wish, some aspiration to accomplish in the future, and then write some graffiti or a message or a picture representing that on, a, on that piece of paper on the wall. And then they slapped a uh, computer vision enhanced image right next to their uh, message, and they were able to connect video testimony to their message. And so other students would come up to the wall and see a message that kind of related to their wishes, their goals, their dreams, and they could uh, pick up that video information from the wall, and then the app also allowed them to share or connect with that student if they had similar uh, hopes and dreams. And one good thing about this is because of now this is connecting physical and digital, you have this nice shared space, this physical space, this reason to come together in this one place, semi-private. But because the wall's gone now, it's just a piece of paper we had to tear it down. Oh, that's me and my messenger picture picture right there. My hope and dream was that their hopes and dreams would be realized. But we took all that information out and then just put it into a book form, right? All the, all the triggers were the same for augmented computer vision algorithm and all their essays put into a book and that was given to the students so they can go back and revisit that at a later time. All right, so that's a couple of examples. Now, moving forward, there are some very important concepts and ideas that we need to think about to make this transition into this era, the, the era that I claim is augmented mass media era, to make it more better for humanity, basically. And they all revolve around these concepts here. Uh, digital citizenship, which basically means literacy for people using it. Well, why are you seeing what you're seeing, right? Um, we're, we still are starting to trying to grasp, like when we Google something, why, do we, why is it on the first page of the results, right? That's still a little bit fuzzy in a lot of our minds. But moving into a more empathic computing era, like when we're talking to our voice assistant or we're getting information curated to us when we get the phone on the face era that's coming very shortly. Um, those search results aren't a page. You get one or two results at most, and it's given to you many times without asking for it. So being able to have the knowledge, or at least the basic literary to know that, to question that information, where it's coming from and why it's being shown to me. A lot of these business models rely on giving you information and advertising dollars are being generated big time into showing you information that's relevant to where you are to kind of guide you, foot traffic, things like that. <laughs> Privacy by design, right? So augmented era, we're going to be, you're going to be uploading more information than you're receiving. So right now in a Google search, you're uploading your query, but then you're getting a ton of search results back. But in this era, 
you're uploading your whereabouts at all time, your eye movement, your body movement, a lot of these other very uh, high bandwidth data points and uploading, but then you're getting very little back because it's being curated off-site most likely with some AI algorithm or something like that. So we're giving more information away than we're receiving in this era. And that's good. that information is going to be more and more valuable as we move forward, even monetarily. And having to be able to put a price tag on that or we need to know what they, who's holding that data and who's uh, mallying that into something that they can curate and show back to us is going to be very important. So what I mean by privacy by design is there's a couple of uh, core values that we need to build into these augmented reality platforms, right? We don't, especially, don't take any more data than you actually need, right? Right now, a lot of internet companies, think the part of the GDPR is changing a lot, the new laws in Europe, but it's really the standard practice for even a lot of commercial operations to make this blanket user agreement that will allow them to just collect anything they want or collect too much because they think they might need it or they might get in trouble for collecting it in the future. This is going to be very problematic, that type of model in the future with augmented reality because you're gonna to start to be able to build psychological profiles. Um, you're going to be able to maybe even exploit um, learning difficulties or you know, um, problems in uh, emotional problems moving into the future by directing and knowing that data, like something like eye movements or how much you move your head and things like that. So that's going to be very important moving forward. And protecting our data, of course, that, that sensitive data that I told moving forward is going to be more important than, than ever to be protected. And then net neutrality, right? So the idea of the digital divide might be exacerbated with this technology because now you can lock information into a physical place or into a picture or into a person. So you, instead of having an open internet where it doesn't matter where you are, what you're looking for information, you could potentially um, need, you would need uh, to be in a certain place or looking at a certain person or be with somebody to get information. So the, that can come with a price tag or a premium and that, that means a lot for us as educators moving forward. So we have to look for that as well. So, and a lot of these new companies, there's a new one called Magic Leap, if you haven't heard of that. So they, one of the biggest rounds of investment ever, right? And they understand this. They're looking to be the new Google search, right? They're looking to surpass Google search so they can show you and curate information for you, um, just like Google does when you get all that ad revenue. So I, that's a billions and billions of dollars in this company that hasn't even really produced much yet because they understand the power of being able to control the pipes of information to you. And so that trial is going to be very important for that moving forward as well. All right, was that too quick? So if anything was fuzzy or anything was, you want some clarification on it, we have a, a website for our research group, maver.site. That's my own personal website, my own personal email, but uh, we have a whole group of researchers in Japan doing a whole bunch of cool stuff. Um, we have one with us today, his name's Josh. He's doing a study on VR and anxiety reduction. Uh, it's a pre-study of broad stuff, it's very interesting. We have some people doing um, academic writing in VR. We have um, people doing uh, a bunch of language learning stuff with augmented reality. A lot of cool stuff happening, so if you want to contact me, I can maybe curate you or show you the person that might be most relevant to talk to in our group, or you can go straight to our group, just search for name or on Google and you can find that information as well. Um, I think that's about all the time that I have, though. Um, if we have a question, time for a question or two, and if there are any, I'd love to take them. Is there any? If not, that's okay too. Um, again, my name's Eric. I really appreciate.